Hello, everyone, and welcome to another class of Atmo 620. Um, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're staying safe and inside. Uh, those on the slides here, on the slide here, are my contact details. Uh, as usual, anything that you need, anything that I could help you with, um, please send me an email, call me on the phone anytime, and I'll be more than happy to help. Same goes if you have questions about the material that we covered the last time. Any questions, anything that is not clear, please uh, send me an email, um, send me a message on the Slack channel, call me on the phone, um, you know, anything that, um, that you want. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Okay, so last time, if you remember, we talked about, we introduced ideal the ideal gas, the concept of ideal gas, and we started talking about some of the properties of the ideal gas. We saw the various laws by Gay Sack, by Boyle, Avogadro, and the others. And we introduced the ideal gas law. We talked about the kinetic theory of ideal gases. Of gases. Uh, we talked about Dalton's law. Um, we saw the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and so forth. Today, we will continue in our journey um, discovering ideal gases. And we will talk about something that you probably are already familiar with and have seen, have likely seen in um, some of your classes that you're taking in high school or, uh, or uh, at some other time in your path in, in college. And uh, what I'm talking about is one of the most important things in uh, thermodynamics. <clears throat> and it's the first principle, principle of thermodynamics. Voila. This is one of those things that you should always know. No matter where you are in life, you should always know what the first principle of thermodynamic is, the second principle of thermodynamic is. If someone woke you up in the middle of the night and asked you, hey, what's the first principle of thermodynamics? You should know right away. You shouldn't even have to think about it because it's such an important uh, cornerstone of of thermodynamics and of the way that we understand gases in uh, in general. So before we start, uh, before we talk about the principle, let's start with the basics. <clears throat> let's start with a basic variable that will play a role in the principle of thermodynamics. This variable is work. Now, work is an old-time favorite of physicists because it can be used in so many things and it tells us important information about our systems. Um, work is one of the simplest functions that says, one of the simplest variables that tells us something about what is happening to the energy of a system, if you will. And the first principle of thermodynamics, in essence, it kind of involves, it has to do with energy, with the energy of a gas. And work uh, being one of the components of one of the key players in the energy of a system, work couldn't be, um, you know, work couldn't be, couldn't but be one of the protagonists of today's lecture. Okay, how do we define work for a gas? Well, the same way that you define it in basic mechanics class. So um, you remember that if you have an object that is uh, being moved, that is subject to a force F, okay, and is displaced by a certain amount delta x. You know, we don't actually care what direction, we just indicate uh, by the vectors. Well, work was the scalar product of uh, f times delta x. If it's in the same direction, let's just say the horizontal direction, it's just simply f times the magnitude times dx, uh, where this is the displacement. Well, for the gas, it kind of works in the same way. Let's assume, assume that you have a gas that has, that is contained in this system here, in the cylinder inside here. <clears throat> Let's assume that the gas has, well, as it must have, a pressure, a temperature, uh, sorry, a pressure, a temperature, and a volume, which in turn define the state of the gas. <clears throat> uh, the pressure is exerted on the, um, on the piston, right, on the container, the pressure is P. And recall that the pressure, as we said last time, was the force that is 
um, that is exerted by the gas on the piston in this case uh, over the area. And so if we consider this face here, that this piston here that is going to move around, the piston has area A, okay? The pressure on this piston is due to a force, and uh, you can write it down like this. Force divided by area is this pressure. Otherwise stated, the force is the product of pressure times the area A, okay? Now let's assume that the gas expands a little bit for whatever reason. Expands, or maybe its temperature increased slightly and has an infinitesimal expansion. The expansion is by a certain amount. Here I call it delta X, but you can call it D. Uh, it doesn't really matter. And let's assume that because it's such an infinitesimal change, the pressure of the gas doesn't change, okay? Pressure doesn't change, A doesn't change, and so the force kind of remains more or less constant, okay? Well, in this case, the work that is done is, remember the definition, F times delta X. Delta X in this figure here is D, right? D. But force is pressure times area, so P times A times D. But what is A times D? A is this area and D is this. So A times D is the volume that is uh, essentially that the gas expands by. So it's the increase in volume of the gas. So another way to write this down is that this is pressure times the change in volume of the gas. We're assuming that the change was small enough that this remains constant, right? So we don't have to worry about introducing the ideal gas law and to see how the pressure changes. Excellent. So work equals pressure times the change in volume. This can be generalized in the case that in the case where you don't have just a small infinitesimal change but you have a finite change and the way to do so is essentially to think of a change of a finite change as the sum of infinitesimal changes. And this, if you remember your math classes, should already say, should already suggest the word integral in your head. And that's exactly how the volume is defined, the, the work is defined. The work where uh, work conducted by the gas during an expansion from volume V1 from volume V2 is equal to the integral from V1 to V2 of the pressure in dV. So if you have uh, a graph, a PV uh, diagram, as we call it, where the x-axis is the volume of the gas, uh, y-axis is the pressure of the gas, uh, you're going from point one to point two. Uh, you're, let's say that V2 is obviously bigger than V1, and so in this case, the gas is expanding. Normally, uh, as, well, normally as, uh, as you may expect, the temper the uh, excuse me, the pressure will decrease when you increase the volume. Okay, because um, well, essentially the density of the gases of the gas uh, becomes lower. Okay, so the pressure goes down, and so you're going from P1 to P2. P2 will be lower than P1, and the gas expands and is conducting some work, and by definition, the work. In this PV diagram, the work is simply the area under this curve here. If, on the other hand, you're compressing the gas, so you're conducting work on the gas, the same is true. Work is still the uh, area under this curve, but now work is negative. And when it's negative, it means that it's done on the gas, okay? And not work that is done by the gas. Uh, plus or minus are simply conventional. So you could live in a universe where work done by the gas is negative and work on the gas is positive. Just be consistent, okay? Pick your favorite, but just be consistent. In a simple case where pressure doesn't change as you go from volume one to volume two, for whatever reason, okay? I mean, pressure doesn't change for whatever reason, as you go from V1 to V2. In this case, the integral is very easy to solve. Simply the height, which is P, times the length, which is the difference in volumes. And this is what we saw before, P times delta V. 
In general, however, this will be more complicated to, uh, to compute. And maybe we don't even have a functional for, maybe this integral isn't even solvable. Okay, because instead of choosing <clears throat> the simple smooth path, you chose, you know, a weird path that, you know, went all kinds of places. And so you cannot solve this integral. Excellent. <clears throat> notice that in principle, well, notice that, not in principle, in reality, not in principle, by definition, <clears throat> the work is highly sensitive to the path that you're following. So whether you're going from one to two with this smooth curve or whether you're going with, you know, a curve like this, will make a difference on the work that is done on the gas. Or, you know, if you're going like this, will make a difference on how you're going, uh, how you're expanding the gas. If you're expanding uh, at the same pressure like this, and then you keep the volume constant and you decrease the pressure like this, like suddenly, you'll also end up in V2, but you'll end up doing, or the gas will end up doing a lot more work than if it had chosen uh, a different path. Okay, so this is important to keep in mind. Okay, second ingredient um, that uh, we want to introduce is uh, heat and energy. We said that the first principle of thermodynamics has to do with energy, and so, of course, we had to talk about energy. Now, what is heat? Well, let's think about this parcel that is expanding, right? As the parcel expands, it's doing some work on the environment because it's pushing the environment out of, out of the way. It's pushing the piston in the example that we saw before. Maybe there's also some kind of exchange in energy. Um, and the exchange may be due to, uh, to whatever. You know, maybe the piston, you know, the, the cylinder that we saw earlier, this thing, maybe this we put on a stove, okay, in our kitchen. And so the base here is really, really hot. And some of the heat, some of the hotness, uh, quote unquote, is being transferred to the gas inside of the piston, okay? So that heat is essentially thermal energy that is exchanged between the gas and the environment, okay? This, uh, this transport, th this exchange of energy, this transport of energy, if you will, is, happens by collisions. So if you have uh, if you have a system, let's we can draw it here. If you have a system where you have this box and the box is on uh, fire, this is my representation of fire. Not great, but you know, I'll leave to your imagination to think that this is fire. Well, uh, this fire, this is heat, okay? that will accelerate the molecules at the bottom of the box, okay? These molecules will start to move around a lot. Obviously, the bottom of the box, so the, the one of the, the bottom of your pan, okay, is a solid, is a metal. And so if you could zoom, uh, the metal will look, uh, will look like this, like, you know, kind of, not exactly like a crystal, but it will look, a bit like this, where you have all the different molecules in place and at more or less, with a more or less regular shape, right? This is, if we could zoom in this thing here. And these normally vibrate around a fixed position. Remember that they're not moving because this is a solid. We're talking about the bottom of your pan, not the gas containing the pan. Uh, these lines I'm drawing, it's just to show just to give you the impression that these are vibrating, okay? When you add heat, you're essentially increasing the vibrations of these molecules. So now they will vibrate a lot, okay, with a lot of energy. These molecules can't go anywhere, pretty much, and so they'll start moving around, well, they'll start vibrating on the spot uh, very, very much. Some of the, uh, when they start vibrating, now, this is the top, let's say that this was the top of the pan, okay? Some of these vibrations happen in all, these vibrations happen in all, in all the directions, so some also happen in this direction, 
and some of these vibrations essentially kick the gas molecules. And these gas molecules who are already moving around with some velocity, some speed, speed distributed as a Maxwell-Boltzmann, of course, they receive an extra kick by uh, these molecules here that are vibrating, and so they accelerate. Okay, they accelerate, and therefore, if you remember, kinetic energy was equal to um, 3 half kBT, Boltzmann time temp times temperature. This will increase uh, the energy contained in the system. Okay, and ultimately, it will also increase um, the temperature. Um, okay, so this is essentially heat and how heat is transferred from between different bodies. Notice that this is radically different from the transfer um, from the transfer that happens, uh, for example, by sound waves. Okay, sound waves are not collision between molecules, but is pressure differences that propagate through a gas. Okay, so sound and heat are two different things. In case there was still some um, uh, some uncertainties now. What regulates, you may ask, well, how does heat work? Like, suppose you have, you know, suppose you have a system like this where you put uh, a pan on the stove and the pan contains a gas. Let's say that you seal the pan. Don't do this at home, but let's say that you seal the pan and there is a gas inside. Okay, you put it on the stove and then you turn on the heat. How does heat propagate into the pan, right? And if you ever cooked anything, this is a question that subconsciously you're always dealing with. You know, suppose you want to boil a potato. How do you boil a potato? Well, you have the potato that is, well, doesn't quite look like a potato now, does it? I don't know. Uh, I don't know how to draw a potato. But let's say that you draw a potato, and this is a potato. Cooking the potato is means essentially transferring heat from the surrounding of the potato, the liquid, all right, transferring heat inside, allowing the heat to propagate inside. And the potato is boiled when heat has propagated inside. You know, when you stick your knife in the potato and the potato is now tender, it's exactly the same uh, process whenever you want to cook meat or anything else. It's essentially transfer of heat from one medium in this case, you're boiling a potato, the medium is water. It could be the pan if you're trying to, uh, to cook meat. Um, transfer heat from one medium to the other. So you might be wondering then, how does heat travel from one body to another or even inside a body? Okay. Well, I promised you in the first class where we talked about some math preliminaries, we talked about this guy called Fourier, and I said, you know, we'll, we'll see this guy... Quite a, quite a few times throughout the class. Well, he was the first person who realized pretty much, yeah, pretty much realized how heat travels. And he realized that the flux of heat through a surface is proportional to the difference in temperature uh, between uh, between uh, the temp the between the body that you're considering and the outside, or between two different points in 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 a particular body. Okay, so you know if you have your potato, and you want to know the flux of heat through uh, a surface inside of the potato, well, the flux of heat will depend on the difference between the temperature inside the potato. Well, sorry, inside this uh, hypothetical shell side of the potato and the temperature right outside that shell of the potato. Okay, the difference in temperature will dictate the flux of heat, how fast heat goes, which also tells you that heats will, heat will flow slower as the uh, inside of the potato warms up and the temperatures become kind of similar. Okay, this quantity, the proportionality constant between the heat flux and the temperature difference is called conductivity. And it depends on the material that you're considering. Boiling a potato takes a certain amount of time because heat flows with a certain rapidity, if you will. Um, cooking something else, cooking celery will take some, you know, different amount of time because heat propagates differently 
And this is kind of similar to Ohm's law for electric circuits, if you remember um, your electrodynamics. Um, but yeah, this is not essential to remember. One quantity that is important uh, when considering how heat is transferred is the so-called heat capacity. Now, heat capacity is essentially telling us something about the change in temperature, well, is telling us something about the relationship between changes in temperature <clears throat> in a body and the heat that is transferred or taken away from that body. Suppose you have, um, suppose you put two objects on a stove, okay? You put uh, a piece of wood on a stove and you put a pan on the stove, all right? You leave them on half a minute, okay? Uh, again, don't do this at home, but suppose, you know, suppose you do this. Now, the stove will keep the, the heat pretty much constant, right? Because you have fire at the bottom, it's going to, you know, it's going to allow heat to propagate inside of the two bodies, the pan or the piece of wood. How do you think, if you were to put a hand on the pan and a hand on the piece of wood after a minute, what do you think will happen to your hand? Well, just by experience, if you put it on the pan, you're going to get burned. If you put it on the piece of wood, assuming the piece of wood hasn't cut fire, if you put it on the piece of wood, you probably won't get burned. Why? Because... One material, uh, like wood, could take in a lot of heat without changing its temperature. The other material changed its temperature right away as soon as heat was provided to it. Okay, And the proportionality constant to this is called heat capacity. Okay, And uh, in case of a gas, uh, we like to define not just the heat capacity, but uh, this quantity that we call specific heat capacity, which is essentially heat capacity defined, uh, divided by the mass that, um, that, we're, uh, that we're dealing with. And so this quantity here, CV, is the specific heat capacity, which doesn't depend on how much gas you're dealing with, okay, you have at the moment. It's just something that is tabulated. But then you have to remember that if you want to use it, you have to multiply it by the mass of the gas that, that you have. This you can find in the textbook, and this you should know. Notice that this specific heat capacity has a V at the bottom, because this means that this is the specific heat capacity for constant volume. There is another heat specific heat capacity that we'll see later, called Cp, that is the, heat, the specific heat capacity at constant pressure. When you're heating up your pan, there's only one way to do it. You put the pan on the stove, and that's that. But in case of the gas, because gas molecules can move around, you can provide heat uh, by um, compressing the gas, okay? Uh, or you could provide heat by, uh, I don't know, changing its pressure in some way. And so you could provide heat essentially by keeping the pressure fixed or the, the volume fixed, essentially. And the gas will change its temperature for a certain input of heat. The gas will change its temperature differently according to how you're providing the heat, okay? So this is why we use two different quantities. The case of a solid doesn't matter because solids don't have the heat capacity, the, the degrees of freedom that, uh, that a gas has. Also notice, uh, this is very important, the heat that is absorbed and the temperature change for the gas are linearly related, okay? Whenever there's a linear relationship, this should be a good day, okay? Because it means that things are going to be simpler when you try to compute them, okay? It's not trivial that, you know, maybe you're, give, you're taking for granted that things are linearly related in this world, but it's not... Um, yeah, but it's not a given that there's a linear relationship between things. So it should always be a good day when you discover that two quantities that in principle have nothing to do with each other are actually linearly related. It will make your life easier when you'll try to do when you'll try to use them to do any kind of calculation. Okay, so um <clears throat> Using the definition of the heat capacity, one result that we get is that 
um, we can actually expand on Fourier's result that we saw earlier. Remember that we saw that the heat flux was proportional to uh, the difference in temperature. And well, actually, um, if you if you uh, consider the uh, rate of change of heat at a certain point, this just by simple energy conservation, this will be due to the energy flux right through that point. So suppose you have uh, a particular, well, let's go back to the potato. Okay, the uh, the ch the change in uh, well the rate of change of heat inside of the potato is equal to the flux of heat, right? So how much heat you're storing is gonna be equal, or the rate at which you're st you're storing heat is proportional to how much flux of heat is coming in, right? This is energy conservation, but also kind of common sense, right? I mean, if if the flux is really high, it means you're providing a lot of heat um, <clears throat> very rapidly. So the heat will uh, build up very quickly, and so this term will be very big, okay? So this is kind of intuitive, that rate of change of heat equals to the flux uh, at a particular point or, um, or within a particular volume, okay? Now remember that we saw that K, uh, Q was equal to minus K, I talked about temperature differences, but in reality, since the world is three-dimensional, uh, this should be a gradient in temperature, right? Remember the gradient? We talked about this first class. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, excellent. Uh, Q, we also saw, was um, equal to mass CV and uh, the uh, and uh, delta T. And so if you plug all these quantities inside here, you obtain this equation that, that tells you how temperature changes, um, in this case, in your potato, okay? How is the temperature of the potato going to change? Well, that will depend on these parameters, these constant, actually, times uh, the second derivative of the temperature. Here, we're talking about potatoes, but it's the same thing if you talk about a parcel of air that contains a lot of uh, gas molecules. Okay, it's exactly the same thing. Okay, uh, this one here, we will not be using it a lot, but I just wanted to show it to you um, just to just so that you know it. This is called the Fourier heat, heat equation, and it's the equation that predicts essentially how temperature changes inside anything inside a solid, inside a gas, inside a liquid, uh, and whatnot. So just keep in mind, <clears throat> uh, and keep in mind the structure of this equation. If you've seen differential equations, it's kind of interesting that this is a first order time derivative. This is a second order space derivative. So pretty interesting. Um, remember before I said, hey, heat is not sound. Well, one way that we know that heat is not sound is that um, pressure waves propagate with a second order derivative in time and second order derivative in space. So this is yet another way <clears throat> that we know. And one of the consequences actually of this different mathematical formulation is that you can have waves propagating in a medium um, you know, wave propagating in a medium and the wave goes. But <clears throat> one of the consequences of this is that this will be, this will essentially always lead to dispersion of heat. Anyway, I don't want to um, go too much on a tangent. If you knew these concepts, great. If you didn't, don't worry, this was just a simple aside uh, to tell you how temperature changes. Don't, um, yeah, don't stress too much if you, um, if you don't remember some of these details. What you should know, however, and what you should remember from this class is what we'll talk about now. And now we're finally ready to introduce the first law or first principle of thermodynamics. And what you have to know is that the first law of thermodynamics 
has to do with energy conservation. So remember before I said, if they wake you up in the middle of the night, you should know what the first law is. Well, you don't have to know how to write it down as long as you know that the first law is a statement about energy conservation in a gas. And the law says the following. Changes in the internal energy of a gas can either be due to work that is done to the gas or by the gas or to heat that is exchanged with the gas. In mathematical form, we write du equals dq minus dw. As simple as that. The minus in front of the dw here, well, that has to do with the convention that <clears throat> work that is done by the gas was a negative sign. But whatever, it doesn't really matter. What matters are these three terms. Nothing else can affect the internal, the changes in internal energy of an ideal gas. And this is, this is massive, okay? We'll put two stars because this is a very important class. This is a very important um, law that we need to keep in mind. Notice that in front of the U's and the Q's and the, the U, the Q, and the W, there are different signs. In front of the U, there is a D, whereas in front of the Q and the W, there is a delta. Why? Well, these are put in place to denote infinitesimal changes. And the infinitesimal change in internal energy is a straight D. Well, is a not straight. It's a uh, Latin letter D, whereas these guys are the Greek letter delta. For the simple reason that this guy here is what we call a perfect differential, okay? Meaning that uh, the change in internal energy from U1 to U2 doesn't depend on how you went to from U1 to U2, okay? So you may have gone through a crazy path, you may have gone through a straight line, through a curve, doesn't matter, okay? And so if you have, um, yeah, and so if you have a system like this, doesn't matter how you go from one point to the other, you will only depend on where you are at that time. We have a name for these kinds of variables. Um, the name is state variables. U, internal energy, is a state variable. Heat and work are not. Um, it, it's a little tricky to see it for work, but for, uh, for heat, but for work, remember I gave you the definition <clears throat> that uh, work was the integral of P in dV, right? Well, if you remember, we saw that in the PV diagram, you could go from point one to point two, and we said, well, the area below the curve, you know, let's say you follow this trajectory, this area is the work. Well, <clears throat> you could have gone following other crazier trajectories and you would have done a different amount of work. That would have also corresponded to a different amount of heat, which in turn they kind of counterbalance and such that the difference between the two is, doesn't depend on the path. But this is essentially why I put the, the Greek delta. And you should keep in mind uh, that internal energy is state of, of uh, state function the other two are not uh, because yeah this um, this is important and it leads to uh, could lead to a lot of uh, misconceptions uh, okay so <clears throat> let's talk about uh, internal energy a little bit more now interesting that internal energy we said it's a state function and so if it's a state variable uh, we should be able to write it down in simple ways. And in fact, you can show <clears throat> from experiments, from theoretical arguments, you can show that the internal energy of an ideal gas can be written as a simple function of the number of molecules in the system times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature. How nice that internal energy also depends on temperature. And also, look, uh, the great couple, Q, B, and T, together again, um, <clears throat> times some kind of proportionality constant. Uh, what is this proportionality constant? Well, F is um, a constant that depends on the degrees of freedom of the gas, okay? Um, also, sorry, before we get into that, uh, these are also other ways, 
that I'm showing here to write down that um, that um, to write down the internal energy. Okay, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on deriving these. If you remember the ideal gas law, this should be kind of uh, and the definition of the um, the gas constants. It should be kind of intuitive how you get that. Interestingly, because of the ideal gas law, U dependent on N, K, B, and T, but also depends on PMV, right? And a simple product. Okay, now, what is F? F is, we said, the degrees of freedom of the gas. <clears throat> now, what do I mean by that? So, right now, so far, we're saying we're approximating the ideal gas essentially as a gas made of spheres, okay? Little billiard balls. How many degrees of freedom has a sphere in our in our world? Well, it is only three, right? So if you're not too familiar with the word degrees of freedom, um, it's the same as saying in how many ways can this molecule move around? Well, in how many ways can a ball move around? Well, the ball can go in this direct in the x direction. The ball can go in the y direction. The ball can go in the z direction. Right? Anything else will be a combination of these three. If the ball goes in this direction, well, it's a combination of these two directions, right? But the ball can't do anything else. So how many do, did we count? Well, one, two, three. So simple balls uh, have three degrees of freedom. Okay, and this is true if you have the so-called uh, monatomic gases. Okay, monatomic gases mean exactly uh, what they are supposed to, what, what the word suggests. The gas, the the molecule is made only of one single atom. Uh, an example of monatomic, uh, monatom, mono, sorry, monatomic gases. Uh, well, any noble gas, so helium. Uh, neon, I want to say xenon, uh, possibly argon, and some other, I, I, I don't think I remember the other three noble gases, but anyway, these, <clears throat> these are monatomic gases, meaning that if you were to look uh, with a magnifying lens, the molecules will contain only one atom. Now, let's suppose that instead of having one single ball, you have two balls, and they are connected. Okay. Well, in this case, we'll talk about diatomic gases. And, well, these um, systems like these ones can certainly translate. So they can move in the x, y, and z direction. x, y, and z direction. But they also have some extra degrees of freedom because they can rotate. They can rotate in this direction and they can rotate in this direction, right? And so this gives you two extra, two additional degrees of freedom. So you have three translational plus two rotational. And so these guys have five degrees of freedom uh, there are complex molecules that are made of more um, more atoms, for example, and these have different additional degrees of freedom because, um, for example, H2O has the oxygen atom and the two hydrogen atoms. Uh, this can rotate in many different ways. Also, these molecules, not only can they rotate, but they can also vibrate, and vibrations add degrees of freedom. And so the, the constant in front of the internal energy depends on, um, on the degrees of freedom of your system, okay? Okay, so um, keeping all that we've seen in mind, okay, uh, let's do some exercises, okay? So, and let's look at... Um, Let's look at uh, excuse me, let me just check one thing. Okay, uh, first, maybe first I'll say this, and then we can do the exercises. <clears throat> 
Um, we mentioned heat capacities before, right? Um, now, the heat capacity, uh, we said, was related to the internal, to the change of temperature of the gas, okay? So if you have a gas, let's suppose that the gas expands, uh, the, the gas, I'm sorry, assume that heat is provided to the gas and assume that uh, pressure, that uh, assume that the volume does not change in the gas, okay? If the volume doesn't change, work is not done on the gas and the gas cannot do any work. And so the heat that is provided also equals the change in internal energy of the gas. This change in internal energy, we have the definition of internal energy. This can be computed uh, very simply. Okay, this we know how to compute, but also we defined uh, the heat that is given, we defined it as something proportional to the change in temperature times <clears throat> the mass times the specific heat. So if you do this calculation here using um, this definition here, F over 2 MRT, so this guy here, delta U V is equal to F over 2 M R delta T, because now there is a change, a change in temperature, okay? Uh, and also, again, appreciate how nice that this is a linear relationship. So if you have to do simple changes, changes are proportional. You don't have weird powers going around. <clears throat> this equals M, specific heat, constant um, at constant volume times delta T. Simplify M, simplify delta T, and you have this very important relationship. Specific heat constant <clears throat> at uh, constant volume equals F over 2 times uh, R, the ideal uh, gas constant. And so for monatomic gases, for example, you'd have that CV equals 3 over 2 times R. Uh, what about what about uh, heat that is provided at constant pressure? Well, for heat that is provided at constant pressure, things are a little bit more complicated because now <clears throat> uh, pressure is constant, but the volume is not constant anymore. And so, uh, suppose that you have, um, suppose that you have, you bring in your gas a constant pressure from A to B, okay? The change in internal energy will be due to the um, heat that is provided minus the work that is done by the gas. The heat that is provided is M times Cp. This is the specific heat constant at constant pressure, okay? Times delta T minus the work is P delta V. Well, wait, how do we know that it's P delta V and not the complicated integral? Well, because pressure now is constant, and so... This, the integral that we had defined that, I remind everyone, is p dv. p is constant, so you can take it out of the integral. <clears throat> this is simply p delta v. You can substitute it here. However, we also know that, um, however, we can also use the ideal gas law, and um, this we can rewrite it very simply as mr delta t, okay? And so if you do that, then the change in internal energy is due to is equal to MCP delta T minus MR delta T. However, we're bringing our system from A to B, right? I'm going to show you the power of having function of state variables over state functions. We brought the system from A to B uh, with a constant pressure, right? And we said, okay, change in internal energy is equal to this stuff, okay? So uh, we can also write this as M times Cp minus R times delta T. However, we could have gone from A to B maintaining a constant volume. Q and W would have been completely different, but the change in internal energy would have been exactly the same, right? And so the change in internal energy maintaining constant volume is equal, by definition of a state function, is equal 
to the change in internal energy at constant pressure. But we knew this, right? This we knew, and in fact, this guy here was equal to mcv delta t. <clears throat> so that means that this quantity must be equal to this quantity here, and therefore you can simplify m and delta t. We also have this important relationship over here. Sorry, I didn't really um, draw it very well, but um, let me put a nice circle. Okay, the specific heat constants and the ideal uh, gas constant or the gas constants are related, okay? Which is also, uh, which is also interesting. Now, before we move to um, the next topic, I just wanna do a, sort of a brief exercise that could be useful. Okay, so <clears throat> we've seen CV and CP. Um, First of all, dry air is mostly, we said, it's mostly nitrogen, N2. What is this? This is a diatomic um, gas. And so CV is F over 2 RD, where this is the uh, gas constant for dry air. F for this equals 2, da, 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 5 over 2. RD. Now, RD, I hope you can all remember from last class, uh, RD, we can write it here, equals 287 uh, joules per um, kilogram per Kelvin. Uh, well, how much is CV then? Well, uh, it's pretty simple. It's uh, this times 5 over 2. CV equals... Uh, you can compute it. This is 717.5, give or take, uh, joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Uh, what about CP? CP will show up so many times in your life. Well, this you can compute is simply the sum of these two by the relation that we saw just now. Well, this is equal to 1,004 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. I can guarantee you that if you become a meteorologist, uh, you'll know this and this by heart. Also, another important quantity that uh, you may remember from thermodynamics is gamma was the ratio between CP and CV. Okay, this is equal to 1.4. Why I'm introducing gamma? Well, you'll see in a moment. Okay, so with the first principle of thermodynamics, let's predict a bunch of things. Let's do some exercises. And so let's assume, for example, that you have a gas and that you're doing some kind of transformation on this gas. And let's assume that in your transformation of the gas, the temperature of the gas doesn't change. We call this transformation isothermal transformation. So the for an isothermal transformation, dt equals to zero. <clears throat> well, if that's true, how much, how big is the change in internal energy? Well, you tell me, it's zero. And so, in isothermal transformations, any change in heat or heat exchange must be equal to the work done uh, by the gas, okay? So, you can write it, you can write this down uh, very simply. Q equals to the integral from V V i to, well, let's call it v1 and v2 of p in dv. Remember, however, that p times v equals n r t, right? Otherwise stated, p equals n r t over v. This is an isothermal transformation though, right? And so t in this case is a constant. So if we write this down as the integral that goes from v1 to V2, uh, P is equal to that stuff. And so we could do NRT over V in DV. Uh, we're not adding or subtracting anything, not adding molecules or taking molecules away. So this is constant. This is a constant. T is also a constant in this tra particular transformation because we're assuming this is an isothermal transformation. So this is equal to NRT 
t integral of dv over v from 1 to 2. This, uh, you know what this is. This is the integral of this is a logarithm. And so this is an RT logarithm of V2 over V1. Okay? <clears throat> so for isothermal transformations, usually it's really hard to compute to determine what is the heat that is added to a system because remember we said heat like work can be dependent on how you obtain that heat. In this case, however, very simple, um, and you can just uh, you can just compute it uh, with a simple mathematical function. What if you have <clears throat> a transformation where the volume now doesn't change? These are uh, called isochoric, isochoric transformation. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, this is pretty intuitive. If the volume doesn't change, what is going to be zero? Exactly, work. And so <clears throat> the heat that is given to the system equals the change of internal energy. This, however, is uh, M, specific heat capacity. Co volume is constant, right? So we're using that times dt. And so the heat, change in heat, simply equal to mcv times the temperature difference, T2 minus T1. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what if we have a cyclic transformation? So if we have, if we're going, if we have a gas and we go from A to B and from B to A, say that this is the PV, okay? Well, uh, isn't U a state function? Right? It depends only on the state. And so the integral from 1 to 2 of du plus the integral of 2 to 1 in du. Uh, cyclical transformations, the integral is usually denoted like this. Well, this is 0. And therefore, what does this tell you? Well, this tells you that the total heat that is exchanged equals to the work that is done. And the work that is done, notice, it's the area under this curve minus the area under that curve, which means it's only this area here. That's the work that is done. Okay, now uh, I would like to introduce, I'd like to introduce another topic. Well, another exercise, not another topic. And then we'll go to the next topic. And the other exercise is, what happens if you don't exchange heat? If you don't exchange heat, delta Q is zero. Well, uh, first principle of thermodynamics, uh, du equals minus dw. Uh, however, this was m c v dt, which for simplicity, m times cv, uh, this is the heat capacity the specific heat capacity, m times cv, is the, it's the heat capacity, dt, equals minus p dv. However, we can use, <coughs> um, we can use, uh, we can divide uh, both these terms uh, by, uh, by t, And we can use the ideal gas law. And if you do the calculation, you will uh, arrive to this point where dt over t equals nr over cp, dp over p, okay? Which is equal, remember that uh, cp and cv are related to r, it's equal to 1 minus cv over cp, uh, dp over p. Cp over Cv, we, d we are defined as gamma, and so this is 1 minus 1 over gamma dp over p. If you take all the integrals, then you will get to um, these three statements. T times p, 1 minus gamma over gamma, this is the power of the p, is equal to a constant. T times v, gamma minus 1, 
equals to a constant. And also p v to the gamma, this is the simplest one to remember, is equal to a constant. So in case of an adiabatic transformation, adiabatic transformation, heat is not exchanged. And it's a little bit more convoluted, but you can get to this um, interesting result. Okay, now <clears throat> on the, since we're talking about adiabatic transformations, um, I want to do, I want to introduce a concept that will be useful uh, to you as meteorologists. So <clears throat> let's stick to adiabatic transformations. We said Q is not exchanged, so Q, delta Q equal to zero. And in that case, Q equal to zero, <clears throat> excuse me, if Q equals to zero, then changes in internal energy equals to the work done by the parcel. And so MCV dt, this is the internal energy, equals minus PdV by definition. Now we're following the same, um, a very similar process as we were doing before. Uh, use the ideal gas law, P equals to MRT over V. Okay, substitute this here. And uh, you can simplify M and you can write R as, um, and uh, sorry, you can rewrite, uh, you can rewrite DV and you get to uh, this, um, it, you can rewrite, oh geez, pardon me. You can rewrite CV as CP minus R and uh, you'd get to CP minus R dt over T equals to minus R dV over V. Okay, so here we're just, uh, we simplified M in these, in both uh, these terms, right? Simplified M. And then we uh, divided everything by temperature. Okay, so we simplified temperature here and wrote it down here. So you have CV dT over T equals to minus R dV over V. But this CV can also be written as CP minus R and you rewrite it like this. Very simple. Now, if you differentiate the ideal gas law, uh, P V equal N R T, let's say that N remains constant, right? Then it's pretty easy to see that you'd get to DP over P plus DV over V equals to DT over T, okay? So you basically you change each one of these terms by an infinitesimal, right? And you divide uh, by, uh, by all the terms and you get, uh, you get to this. This, you can plug it in. And if you put everything together, you arrive to this point where you have CP dT over T equals to R dP over P. <clears throat> now, you're, you can imagine you have a parcel that's going from T0, P0 to TP. You integrate this one from P0 to P and this one from T0 to T, okay? What this is gonna give you, we'll do it by step, um, the integral of CP dT over T from T0 to T. This will give you CP logarithm <coughs> of uh, T over T0, which also by the laws of logarithm, I hope you remember this, this is logarithm of T over T0 to CP power. Uh, you do the same for this. So the integral from P0 to P of R dP over P. And this becomes R logarithm <coughs> of, uh, excuse me, P over P0, okay? So these two are equal, okay? And so the logarithm of T over T0 equals to R over CP logarithm of P over P0, which is also equal to the logarithm of P over P0 to the power of R over CP. You exponentiate both terms and the logarithm go away. And that's what you end up having. T equals T0 times P over P0 to the R over CP power. What this is telling us is that if you have a parcel um, that is moving with 
without exchanging heat, sort of moving adiabatically, then the temperature and the pressure of the parcel are going to be related by that equation. Usually, P0 is, um, the, this P0 is taken as 1,000 hectopascals, and this temperature here is called, uh, is denoted with a theta, and this is called potential temperature, okay? So the potential temperature is the temperature that a dry parcel of air would have if it was brought adiabatically to 1,000 hectopascals. Why is potential temperature important? Well, because potential temperature doesn't depend on the state, uh, sorry, doesn't depend on uh, the path, and it is a way to, it's conserved adiabatically, okay? So if you do any kind of adi adiabatic transformation on the parcel, so if you move the parcel around without giving it heat, you expand it, you contract it, potential temperature is always going to be the same, okay? And so temperature isn't, right? Because if you, com uh, if you compress the gas, temperature will increase, but potential temperature will remain the same. So if you have a parcel near the surface of the, air, of the atmosphere and a parcel at 10 kilometers, you can't really compute, you can't really compare these two parcels because they're, they're too far apart. They're too different from each other. But if you look at their, so if you, you cannot compare the temperature, right? Because they're so distant and they're so different. But if you look at their potential temperature, it's the same as saying, hey, let's take these two parcels and bring them at the same level and then let's look at them. Okay, uh, finally, um, another quantity that is kind of useful uh, is another, um, it's another state variable that is called enthalpy. Enthalpy is good. Um, okay, so we'll introduce a number of state variables and you'll see, and you've probably seen when you study thermodynamics that there are many state variables in thermodynamics. Why are there so many state variables? Well, because state variables have different properties and are conserved under different kinds of processes. And so when you're considering a certain process, it may make sense to use a certain state variable or another. Enthalpy is a great uh, quantity that <clears throat> is convenient to use because it is conserved uh, when the pressure doesn't change, okay? Enthalpy is, is defined in this form sum of internal energy plus the product of pressure and volume, okay? And the first law of thermodynamics for enthalpy, uh, or in terms of enthalpy, can be written as that the change in internal, in, excuse me, the change in enthalpy is given by the change in internal energy plus something that looks like work but isn't quite work, times uh, plus V times dP. Remember, work is P times dV, right? And so if you have an isobaric process and a process in which, um, for example, the internal energy doesn't change, well, then enthalpy also doesn't change. Enthalpy can be written in terms of simple functions, uh, in terms of simple quantities, you don't have to remember all the all these processes. Just keep in mind this. Enthalpy equals M, the mass, the uh, specific heat uh, capacity at constant pressure now times T. Remember that uh, for internal energy, it was similar, but with uh, constant volume. Enthalpy somehow is a more natural variable to use when the pressure is constant, okay? And this is how you write it in terms of temperature. Uh, of um, of the gas. Also, another quantity that is important and one of the reasons why uh, enthalpy is useful is a quantity known as latent heat. Latent heat is the reason why we have thunderstorms, essentially. And it's the heat that is absorbed to transition from one phase of uh, matter to another, okay? And the reason why enthalpy is useful to think about these kinds of phase changes is that phase changes very often happen at constant pressure. And so somehow enthalpy is a bit more natural, a variable to use. And 
the latent heat is precisely the difference in enthalpy between the state in one particular phase and the state in the other phase. Okay, so the latent heat of uh, vaporization is the late is the enthalpy of the liquid minus the enthalpy of the vapor. Okay, and it's the heat that is needed to break all the bonds between the molecules, uh, essentially to free them up, to make them evaporate from the vapor phase. And um, one, so the only thing, again, there are a lot of mathematical formula around here, like this stuff and uh, a lot of stuff here. We'll not be using enthalpy a whole lot. Just remember the definition. Remember um, how we can write it down. Remember what uh, latent heat is. And also remember that because of um, identities between, because of the behaviors of, because of how we defined uh, enthalpy because of thermodynamics, th thermodynamic identities, then it's possible to determine this thing that is called Kirchhoff's law or Kirchhoff's equation that essentially tells us how the latent heat changes as a function of temperature. Oops, excuse me. And this simply tells us that change in latent heat with respect to temperature is the difference between the specific heat uh, at constant pressure between one phase and the specific heat and the other phase. So if you want to know um, how a specific heat of vaporization changes as a function of temperature, this is exactly the way to compute it. Okay, so just keep this in mind. Um, but um, yeah, details, um, to find details about this stuff, integrating equations, uh, yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to remember. Just just remember what enthalpy is and um, and why it's useful when talking about latent heat. Okay. Okay. Um, I think this is the end of what I wanted to tell you today. I hope I hope things were clear. First principle of thermodynamics. Just keep in mind energy conservation. Okay, and everything else will follow. As usual, if you have questions, if you want uh, to discuss things, we will meet in class. Uh, but if you have immediate questions, I'm more than happy to discuss with you about, uh, about um, any doubts or any uncertainties that you might have. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you well, first in class and then for the next lecture.